the BPO industry is going to start uh, growing significantly in 2021. Because like I said earlier, now is the time when they're figuring out how much of the organization is going to survive and from what will survive, how much will be pushed to the Philippines. We call them lower cost and increasing productivity, the revival of tourism. And especially now, people take for granted that we built eight airports, nine airports in the last seven, uh, 10 years. And most of those airports were completed in under four years. Then you've got the remittances coming through. You've got foreign direct investors coming through. I mean, all those things are going to propel us for a quicker recovery than what most people think. So Iloilo, to me, and I've said this for the last eight years, 10 years, that it is the best example of what happens when national government, local government, the business community, and the academe work hand in hand very closely together to uh, transform society, the local government uh, environment. Bonifacio land prices have tra tracked um, the GDP for the last 20 years, right? And uh, with only one exception, every time the GDP contracts, the best case of Bonifacio is status quo, meaning it didn't fall with the GDP. I think Alabang is the best place to live. I think it's the best place to work in. I, I think the prices are irrationally discounted. I mean, how do you explain Forbes Park at 400,000? or Das Marinas at 500, 550,000 per square meter. And then you've got Ayala Labang, which is the best village in the Philippines, I think, priced at 100,000 per square meter. One fourth of what Makati is, or one fifth compared to Dasma. That, that discount is irrational. It should be much, much closer to Makati prices, but it's not. We were talking about a lot of things that have been shifting and pivoting in this new normal, since a lot of people have been uh, getting used to e-commerce. Uh, will we ever go back or how long will it take before we go back to levels where foot traffic is uh, where it was in 2019 uh, in malls or other retail establishments? I think utilitarian shopping will be pretty much online. So grocery, it doesn't really matter what the pasta looks like for as long as you know the brand, right? You don't need to smell it, you don't need to touch it. The broccoli, maybe, you might want to touch it, right? Uh, but utilitarian shopping will move online predominantly, okay? But when it comes to buying stuff like um, toys, shoes for ladies, or shoes for men, because you know our feet sizes are different, or whether we look fat or slender in a shirt, those things will immediately go back to brick and mortar. There is no pleasure in shopping online for clothes, bags, shoes, cologne, um, makeup, nothing, zero, okay? And people are only doing that because they cannot stomach K-drama anymore or Netflix. <laughs> And uh, they will they will shop sometime in the day, only because that's the only thing they can do. Mm. But as soon as we are allowed back into the malls, we will rush back into the malls. We will go ice skating. We will hold hands with our lovers and watch a movie, and uh, be sweet with other people again. And uh, we will go shopping like crazy. Uh, because that is human nature and that has been in the genetic profile of humanity for thousands of years and a virus is not going to change that. Great insight. So we're going back eventually, especially as the vaccine triggers, triggers people to become more confident also uh, in the next few months. For people who have cash right now, uh, and in, their cash flow has been uninterrupted, then they have capital that they can deploy. Uh, should do you suggest right now that they be aggressive already in looking out for uh, bargains, or would you say that they should be at least 
a bit more cautious still based on what's going on. That's a good question. Now, speaking of bargains, there have been very few. Hmm. So, a lot of buyers, we've had more buyers say, I want a COVID discount if I want to buy anything today. And I go and say, okay, yeah, okay, but there are very few COVID discounts. There's a lot of COVID discounts in the middle market and below, but nobody, frankly, wants to buy that. If you want landed property in the business districts, there's maybe three lots, four, six. It's not much compared to the amount of money that's out there. Now, yes, be selective because um, it's very high risk. I've always said to people, look, if you don't have Bonifacio or Makati in your portfolio, then you should have for the last 10 years done that. And if you haven't done that today, um, there's very few lots out there for sale. And um, we just have to figure out another way to de-risk you from the property market. Because people will be reminded in this crisis that there is a balance between supply and demand. And they have to understand the drivers of demand. If they miss that and ignore that, then they are going to get hit very badly by this crisis. You, you talk a lot about the developments in the country in terms of infrastructure. Um, should people position in projects that are completing in a year, year or two from now as well that could give them a possible upside better than, say, Bonifacio or Makati? Would that be a good strategy for those who were late in the game and were not able to position? Yes. So, number one, the trains, there, there are three trains that are under construction and theoretically, you could buy as close to the station as you can because those stations will have a dramatic impact on movement of people, right? Well, yes and no. You just have to look at LRT and Taft Avenue all the way to Recto, all the way to Rizal Avenue. I don't think anybody there has said, wow, you know, the station has really added to the project uh, feasibility, right? If ever any did benefit, it's marginal, right? It's not really because of the train. If you look at the very famous MRT, three or whatever, one, I don't know, I, I lost count, but the one on ENSA, I don't think anybody is saying, wow, you know, the train was a big contributor to the success of this project. Mm. Um, SMDC might have, might, but frankly, I, I don't think the right, the, the, the commuters of the train line are the same ones that are buying or renting in the condos. Yeah. Got it. I think it's just an ad plus to be close to an MRT station, hoping that one day the government or somebody will figure out how to run those things efficiently and professionally so it doesn't look like a mess. What's your take on a REIT as they, uh, they purchased another building uh, in Ortigas, which was part of Ayala Land uh, over, the past, over the past years, and they just placed it as, as part of their portfolio. How does this increase their value and, inter and yield as well? Ayala Land is the largest owner of office space in the Philippines for now, as of now. As of now, it's probably not going to stay that way. But the amount of office space they have, that they own, versus what they've put in that read, is negligible, mm. right? What they put in that read is negligible. Four buildings with a total footprint of, uh, I don't know, what is it now? Is it 200,000 square meters? Maybe somewhere there. That to me is a trial balloon. The trial balloon, but the REIT, the REIT industry in the Philippines will jump significantly. So you've got the R REIT, the Robinson Street. You've got the DD REIT, which is the uh, Double Dragon REIT coming up. So those are the two front runners. You've got Mega World for sure coming up with their own REIT. You've got SM, and I am so excited about the SM REIT because that potentially could be as big in market cap as the mothership. Oh. You know? So, and nobody has the footprint that SM has. Mm. The scale and the footprint and the presence and the tenant mix, the, the geographic diversity, nobody has that the way SM has it. And um, the land bank alone, my God. 
So, what can you read? Office space is the simple low-lying fruit. You've got hospitals, you've got roads, you've got bridges, you've got tollways, you've got hotels, logistics, warehouses, airports, retail banks, bank outlets, food outlets. So Jollibee can theoretically read all the stores it owns, right? Um, so they don't just sell chicken and uh, chicken joy palabok anymore and mango pie. Um, they can read all those stores. BDO can read all their branches. Mm. Stopping them from doing so. It's very exciting because they will offer the market 5-6% yield, right? Mm. The retail market will think, ah, oh, that is too low. Masyadong mabagal yan. But you know what? The institutional investors yeah. will say, oh my God, I've got bonds earning 0.6 before withholding tax percent per annum. And then I'll just shift that to A read, B read, C read, M read, S read, R read, and make five times what I could have lending to the government or to corporates with very little risk. I mean, you look at the office sector, 95% of rents continue to be paid throughout the COVID crisis, right? Unless you are a micro, small, medium-sized enterprise, who've been given a grant by the government to defer your rent for six months, the corporates, the conglomerates, continue to pay rent. And um, that will ensure the cash flows for REIT. And this is like one of the worst crises humanity's ever been hit with economically. Mm -hmm. It shows you how resilient the office sector is globally, not just in the Philippines, but especially in the Philippines. And the best testament to that is how Ayala had the guts to time the a read and stick it out all the way through to the COVID crisis. You know, the, the index went down by how much uh, in March from February? March. We dropped to four or five. <laughs> to four or five from seven, right? Yep. So that's a 50, 60% erosion in value. a read only lost 10%, right? And then now it's up 10, it's plus 10 percent. And if you look at Singapore, which is the which is the golden standard of REITs globally, the last 10 years, the Singapore REIT index gave you a significant advantage and return over the straight times index. You know, over a span of 10 years, uh, so I'm not talking about blips. I'm talking about a 10 year period and you would have been way ahead in the market holding on to Singapore REITs and I think you will have the same resilience and, and investment returns in the Philippines. Why? Because uh, two things, the institutional investors will are tired of riding roller coaster stocks and second, <laughs> the collapsing interest rates will drive them to something more stable. What would be your um, closing message for everyone for 2020 for 2020 or anything that they could look forward to as an investor for 2021 as well I think um, now is the time to be invested whether you want to go into the stock market or the property market there is a euphoria that people will experience sometime when the vaccines are on short why do I say that because there are many factors that are working together to make the Philippines significantly better in this recovery. And I'll, I'll just bear with me as I name them, okay? First one is the ma amazing management, fiscal management of the country by Secretary, Secretary Dominguez and team, okay? Because of the, the way they've managed it, they've been able to borrow money, record amounts at record interest rates, historically low, the 10-year T-bill, the 25-year T-bill are, historical lows for the Philippines and why is that important because that will translate to a mortgage market that will emerge in the Philippines beginning next year when the banks start releasing funds again to the market what is a mortgage market the mortgage market means in the developed countries you can borrow 30 year you can borrow 30 year money fixed for 30 years at 2 3% you know, uh, 
in the Philippines, you can borrow money at 9 to 11 percent if you want to fix it for 10 years. That will choke you. That will kill you, right? Very expensive money, 10 years. 10 years pa lang yun. But just imagine if you're able to borrow 10 year money at 7 percent or 8 percent. If you're able to borrow 20 year money at 7, 8 percent. It's still high globally, but okay na yun for Philippines if you're guaranteed a 20 year fixed rate or a 30 year fixed rate. And that will have a tremendous impact on real estate, especially in the housing market, because that will empower many people to borrow money safely so that they can finally afford their own home and they don't have to rely on grandma and grandpa for housing. Okay, which the middle class of today and below still are living with grandma and grandpa's resources. Right. Record low interest rates and the credit rating upgrade, right? And and the and the amount of borrowing that they've done flowing into this economy is just gonna to translate to pump priming. Number two is the massive injection of infrastructure. There are 12 projects that should have been completed in the next 12 months, but they're now delayed because of COVID. So they will be completed within a period of 18 months. That single biggest injection of infrastructure the Philippines has ever seen in its history is going to translate to significant for economic productivity per capita. Meaning, instead of people losing their time in the car six hours a day, they will have three hours, four hours a day each day now for other things other than sitting in the car and gaining weight. <laughs> Number three, uh, the BPO industry is going to start uh, growing significantly in 2021 because like I said earlier, now is the time when they're figuring out how much of the organization is going to survive and from what will survive, how much will be pushed to the Philippines. We bought them lower cost and increasing productivity. Number four, the revival of tourism and especially now, People take for granted that we built eight airports, nine airports in the last seven, uh, ten years. And most of those airports were completed in under four years. I mean, four years ago to today, right? I mean, if you look at Davao and Iloilo Airport, the first two, right? But after that, and this was ten years ago, these two. But then after that, we built Mactan, Anglao, uh, San Vicente, El Nido, uh, Chargao, there's two, three more. And then the most exciting thing is Clark. Because Clark is going to open tourism to northern Luzon, to all the global surfers out there who will enjoy La Union, right? And uh, Pangasinan, and Ilocos, and Pagudpot. I mean, before, if you wanted to go to Pagudpot, you had to kawawa ka naman. You had to fly to Naia and then crawl your way to Balintawak. <laughs> And then from Palintawak, start your 14-hour journey by car going to Pagudpod. And what many people don't realize is that the roads from Clark all the way to Baguio to Pagudpod are beautiful drives. It's almost like your, your Pinoy version of San Francisco, California uh, road trek, right? And you know, Marvin, I'm not exaggerating. The T-Flex, the N-Lex today, they're some of the most beautiful roads you can see in the world. Right? And the coastlines of, of um, La Union are similar to, to Australia's coastline, except that it's darker sun. <laughs> Not because we're Pinoy sun, but because it's volcanic. <laughs> so, tourism, global tourism. You know, the access to all these islands bypassing Manila is going to make the tourist, the foreign tourist experience of going to the Philippines so much better because they don't have to go through the chaos of Manila. You know, from Hong Kong, you land to Clark. From Clark, you fly to Boracay or El Nido or Palawan uh, to Puerto Princesa or to Boracay directly bypassing Manila. That experience is so fantastic. And then when you get out and you get into the car, it's not going to take you one hour to look for your baggage and go for immigration. It'll only take you 10 minutes. And then from there, you go to your car and uh, the drive is so smooth. I mean, so many things are working in favor of the Philippines. What else? Then you've got the remittances coming 
through. You've got foreign direct investors coming through. I mean, all those things are going to propel us for a quicker recovery than what most people think. So much to look forward to for, for next year. For those who want to hear more of David's insights, this is what I'll do. I'll put the link below uh, for Lichu Property Consultant's uh, YouTube channel so you can watch more of his insights even after this video. And subscribe to their channel. You don't have to subscribe to mine. Just go to their channel, watch their videos, consume their content because you learn more from David Lichu more than me. But before I let you go, David... That's not true. That's not true. But thank you, Marvin, for your kind endorsement. Before I let you go, people like this portion of, of the video where we do fast talk. I'll give you two options. No right or wrong. Pick pick one. Just pick one. Top of your top of your head. Very, very quick. Okay, let's, let's do this. Steak or salmon? Steak. Jordan or Kobe? Jordan, because I'm older. <laughs> Success or significance? Success. Large, massive mansion or travel the world? Travel the world. Win 100 times but lose 50 times in between? Or win once and never lose at all? I would take losing. 100 million doing what you love or 1 billion doing something you don't love? 1 billion. Work hard, work smart. Work hard. US dollar, euro? Dollar. Bitcoin, gold? Gold. Fitness, finance? Finance. City or country? City. Beach or mountains? Beach. Cut loss or hold? Cut loss. Die with a lot of money or die fulfilling purpose? Die with a lot of money <laughs> because money usually solves a lot of problems. Win one time, big time, or win small but repeatedly? Small and repeatedly. Got it. Thank you so much, David Lichu, for joining us. I hope you guys got a lot from this and I hope it was something very, very insightful. So thank you guys. I hope this video helps you trade well, trade strong, trade smart. See you all again soon and God bless.